Hi, my name is Erin Helliard, and I'm a senior lecturer in historical performance at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. You might not be so familiar with this instrument. It's called a harpsichord. It was invented before the piano, and it's this kind of instrument that Bach, the composer of the piece I just played, was familiar with. When I was a teenager, I played all sorts of repertoire on the piano, but I do remember feeling uncomfortable about some of the pieces I played, the music of Bach, for example, just didn't feel right to me, whereas Debussy felt fine. When I discovered the harpsichord and played Bach on it, it felt like a perfect fit. And since then, I've been hugely interested in the ways musicians played in the past, and also in the different kinds of instruments that they used. Being interested in historical performance means being a curious musician. It means being a bit of a time traveller as well. Matching the appropriate instrument with historical repertoire is just one of the avenues available for you here at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. We have a whole range of historical instruments available for experimentation and mastery. Being aware and curious about the past and being open to all different kinds of music making helps you become a better, more well-rounded and a more engaged musician. The fantastic staff in our Historical Performance Division are all active practitioners and researchers. When you start to match the software and the hardware together, you too can make all sorts of interesting discoveries, and what was old can sound new again. Hey, my name is James, I play the Baroque violin, and I'm currently in my fourth year studying at the Con. In this video, I'm going to be going over what historically informed performance is, and also having a look at what makes playing the Baroque violin different to playing the modern violin. Historically informed performance is essentially what it sounds like. We look at various sources throughout history to inform our playing, with the ultimate goal of trying to recreate the music as it would have been heard at the time of its composition. This can be really exciting because whilst there was quite a lot written down, there also was a lot that wasn't written down about the way things were played, and it leaves it up to us to interpret what we read and what we learn to, in a way, create something new. The earlier we go, we find composers put less and less on the page because it was the norm at the time for performers to play in a certain way without it being notated. Something as basic as the way rhythms were notated in a piece of music may not have actually been played in the same way that they were written. A lot of these performance techniques and styles were likely taken for granted at the time, so it's up to us to uncover these ways of playing through our own research. Okay, so that's historical performance. Now on to the violin. Now this is my Baroque violin. Actually, it belongs to the con. A lot of what we're able to learn about the way music was played comes from the equipment that was being used. Take a look at the modern bow and the Baroque bow. You can see there is quite a big difference in shape. Now this in itself is going to influence the way a note sounds when it's played. Typically you'd find a modern bow maintains a pretty steady volume level from frog to tip. Whereas simply by the shape of it, a Baroque bow has a tendency to taper the sound towards the tip. This is really important because we know from reading treatises and writings from the time that the idea of text, speech and rhetoric were held in high regard when it came to making music. And the shape of this bow allows us to more accurately recreate the way someone would sing or speak. Onto the violin itself, uh, you'll find the biggest difference is that we play on gut strings rather than metal strings. Uh, in fact, this was the norm up until the early 20th century. They produce a pretty different sound to metal strings. It's a lot more organic, uh, raw, uh, but also quite beautiful. Gut strings also tend to produce much more complex overtones, which I really enjoy in my playing, especially when you play a double stop perfectly in tune and the overtones lock together and create a, a sound that's bigger than the sum of its parts. The further we go back in time, the less extra stuff we find on the violin as well. Uh, you'll find a lot of Baroque violinists play what we call chin off, which is exactly what it sounds like with no shoulder rest and no chin rest, 
Although, feel free to put whatever you want underneath there to prop the violin up and, you know, whatever works for your body. There's a few more differences between modern and Baroque violins. Uh, there's a shorter fingerboard on the Baroque violin, which was increased in length over time as pieces went higher and higher. Also, the angle of the neck to the body of the instrument increased over time in order to increase the tension on the strings and create more projection as concert halls and, and bigger concerts became more popular. Cool, thanks for watching. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, I might just finish up with a bit of Corelli on the violin for you. Listen to how different the sound of this passage is when I change my bow. 
So this is the normal hold. And this is now the hand under hold, as it's called. I really enjoy the amount of experimentation we get to do as historical performance students.